This week, we're taking a look back at some of the events that helped to make 2019 a pivotal period for our planet's climate. So sit back, grab another mince pie, and get ready for a roller coaster ride through 12 dramatic months in the next 15 minutes. Hello, and welcome to the very last Just Have a Think programme of the year. So how was it for you then? Well, here in the Northern Hemisphere, we catapulted into January on the back of an Arctic report card from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration that showed the Arctic continuing to warm at least twice as fast as the rest of the planet, resulting in younger, thinner Arctic sea ice covering less area than in the past. Noah told us that the 12 lowest sea ice extents in the satellite record had occurred between 2006 and 2018, and that the increased temperatures were continuing to drive decreasing snow cover and increased melting across the Greenland ice sheet. But ironically, we also witnessed record-breaking snowstorms in the heart of Europe, causing chaos and mayhem even in well-prepared nations like Germany and Austria, where 12 people tragically lost their lives. Meanwhile, over in South America, severe flooding dominated the first month of the year, with more than a third of the population of six major regions in Argentina getting evacuated to safer ground, and the state of Uruguayana in Brazil receiving 20 inches of rain in just 72 hours, displacing more than 2,000 people. And similar numbers of casualties were suffered in Sulawesi in Indonesia, as heavy rain, strong winds and high tides caused rivers to overflow. The province recorded over a foot of rain in 24 hours, damaging thousands of homes and displacing at least 6,000 people. Back at the start of the year, Australia broke 17 temperature records in the first month, with Adelaide hitting 46.6 degrees Celsius and Port Augusta reaching an all-time Aussie high of 49.5 Celsius. But even on the driest inhabited continent on Earth, the flood still arrived, with 20 inches of rain in 48 hours up in northern Queensland, forcing the state government to declare a disaster situation. February brought the first climate report of the year, when the United Nations released what they called a roadmap to the December Climate Summit, stating that 2019 was the last chance for the international community to take effective action on climate change. In that same month, Britain's Institute for Public Policy Research published its own major report simply entitled This is a Crisis. Their message was quite stark. Mainstream political and policy debates have failed to recognise that human impacts on the environment have reached a critical stage, potentially eroding the conditions upon which socio-economic stability is possible. And then, as if to reinforce that argument, a meandering jet stream and collapsing polar vortex caused the worst cold period in the United States for decades, effectively dumping the Arctic's winter weather straight across the Midwest. At least 21 people were killed, and 90 million endured temperatures of minus 17 degrees Celsius, with some regions dropping as low as minus 40 degrees Celsius, making them colder than the North Pole. Almost everywhere else on the globe, a theme was beginning to take shape that would arguably come to define the entire year's weather patterns. And that theme was severe flooding. February brought major floods and landslides to Peru, killing 51 and injuring 79. Brazil, Ecuador and Colombia all got battered by rains and landslides, causing at least 20 fatalities and displacing thousands. And over in Pakistan, almost three months of flooding began on the 21st of February, with 25 fatalities in the Balochistan province. As we pressed relentlessly on into March, a teenage climate activist by the name of Greta Thunberg came to global attention for the first time, when her climate protest strategy of bunking off school every Friday and sitting outside the Swedish parliament holding a strike for climate placard caught the imagination of millions of other school kids and inspired the global school strike for climate movement that went completely viral all over the world. In the renewable energy arena, for the first time ever, solar and wind power were both declared cheaper than most coal-fired electricity production, marking a key tipping point in the ongoing demise of the fossil fuel industries, but the month was marred by yet more extreme weather events as the deadliest cyclone ever to be recorded in the southern hemisphere clattered into Mozambique, Malawi and Zimbabwe. 
In an excruciatingly slow five-day crawl across those three countries, Cyclone Idai left a trail of utter destruction, including 1,300 fatalities and countless others missing. Even as far south as New Zealand, a state of emergency had to be declared on South Island as bridges and roads were washed away and power and communication lines were destroyed by what that country's Water Institute described as an atmospheric river with a footprint stretching some 5,000 kilometres all the way from the Timor Sea. More than three feet of rain fell within 48 hours, the highest ever total for New Zealand. And just when the farmers of the American Midwest were breathing a brief sigh of relief after the February Arctic freeze, the relentlessly torrential rains arrived there as well. The first quarter of 2019 was the wettest on record in the United States. At least three people were killed, new record river levels were set in 42 different locations, and at least a million acres of US farmland in nine major grain producing states were completely flooded. By the end of March, only about 56% of the expected corn and soybean planting had actually taken place. Northern Hemisphere springtime marched onwards into April, and also marching onwards was a new bunch of upstarts calling themselves Extinction Rebellion, or XR. This lot hit the international headlines as they mobilised tens of thousands of people from every region in the United Kingdom to converge on London bringing large areas of our capital city to a complete standstill for two whole weeks in an entirely peaceful but very disruptive exercise to get across the four demands for climate mitigation. The XR movement has now gone pretty much global, so expect to see a protester glued to a building near you very soon. April also saw the publication of the International Renewable Energy Agency's Roadmap to 2050, explaining how we might transform our energy and electrification over the next three decades. And of course here at JHAT we had a good look at what they were suggesting, all of which you can see in more detail by clicking up there somewhere. But the skies kept putting pressure onto poorly prepared communities all over the planet. Floods continued to ravage countries across the Americas, Africa, Asia, Europe and the Middle East, including Syria where the waters completely displaced the already displaced refugees in the camps of Idlib province. India and Bangladesh were hit by Cyclone Fani, the strongest cyclone seen in that part of the world since 1999. Cyclone Kenneth hit Mozambique and Tanzania with a force greater than any storm those countries have experienced since records began, killing at least 100 people and causing damage estimated at $100 million. Meanwhile, just to the north, severe droughts pushed nearly 11 million people in Ethiopia, Kenya and Somalia towards extreme hunger and disease, including cholera, as crops failed, cattle died and water sources became contaminated. A couple of starkly contrasting climate declarations hit our screens in May of this year. Starting with the United Kingdom government, who, having met with a delegation from Extinction Rebellion and under pressure from their own Committee on Climate Change, officially declared a climate emergency and set a target to reach net carbon zero emissions by 2050, the first major economy to do so. In that same week, up at the 11th Ministerial Meeting of the Arctic Council, US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo gave a speech celebrating the rapidly declining Arctic sea ice and welcoming the almost unimaginably exciting commercial opportunities that would soon be made available by the newly opened Northern Ocean trade routes and access to previously unavailable Arctic fossil fuels, even going as far as to describe methane as freedom gas. June marked the start of a long Northern Hemisphere summer dominated by extreme heat events, with almost 400 all-time high temperatures being set, kicking off in India, where some regions experienced temperatures surpassing 45 degrees Celsius for almost three weeks. June the 10th was the hottest day ever recorded in Delhi at 48 degrees Celsius, and this year also brought the hottest July ever recorded in that country. 65% of the population were exposed to temperatures above 40 degrees Celsius every day for over two months, the longest heat wave in India's history. Similar deadly heat waves were also endured in Europe, North America and Japan, and then the wildfires began. Of course, wildfires happen every year, but rarely with the magnitude we witnessed in 2019. California's annual fires are probably the best known, and this year's were particularly brutal, 
But fires were also raging out of control in the Arctic Circle, in southern European countries like Greece, Portugal and Croatia, and all over South America during July and August. China eased us into September with the second costliest typhoon of all time, Typhoon Lakima. Lakima killed at least 28 people and a million others had to be evacuated to safety. Storm Dorian battered the Bahamas, turning out to be the strongest hurricane ever to hit that country and one of the strongest Atlantic hurricanes on record. Storm Imelda made landfall on the Gulf Coast as the fifth wettest storm in US history, dumping 40 inches of rain on Texas and the relentless floods kept coming and coming, causing major problems wherever they struck. In some cases, hitting areas that hadn't fully recovered from the first and second lot of deluges earlier in the year. November proved to be a bit like Groundhog Day for the United States, as a repeat of the polar vortex collapse at the start of the year caused the Arctic to dump its frozen temperatures yet again across vast swathes of the lower 48, bringing record-breaking low temperatures closing many schools and causing the cancellation of more than a thousand flights. As we trundled into the final month of 2019, the United Nations held the COP25 climate conference in Madrid in Spain, where the nations of the world spent two weeks discussing the new global carbon pricing program, as well as how to significantly increase their nationally determined contributions towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions before concluding the conference with complete failure to agree on how to move forward on either of those two crucial challenges. And while all that was going on in the Northern Hemisphere, down in the Southern Hemisphere, Australia was witnessing the onset of late spring bushfires that would go on to reach catastrophically uncontrollable proportions. Right now, as I'm standing here talking to you in the very last week of the year, the map of Australia looks a bit like most of it's on fire. The Prime Minister Scott Morrison has kindly deigned to return from his family holiday in Hawaii and has actually conceded on national television that there is no argument about the human influence on climate change and its impact on the severity of the bushfires his country is currently enduring. And yet still, after all we've witnessed around the planet in this dramatic and potentially pivotal year for our climate, cynics will be gently swaying in their rocking chairs, saying things like, so we've had some bad weather and admittedly some tragic casualties, but most people seem to be getting on with their everyday lives more or less as normal. So should we really be so obsessively concerned about these apparent changes in our climate? And those same folks will be comforting themselves with the reassuring notion that our climate has always been changing and always will. It's just nature's way and we humans are spectacularly good at adapting and overcoming. Trouble is though, right now, as we prepare to go into 2020, we're only just at the very bottom of an exponentially rising curve of climate consequences. All the scientifically accepted indicators suggest that what we witnessed this year, far from being a freak year for weather, is actually set to become the baseline norm as we go through the next decade and beyond. 2019 showed us how just one degree Celsius of extra atmospheric warming can dramatically and dangerously alter our planet's climatic balance. On our current emissions trajectory, we'll be another degree or so warmer in 20 to 30 years time, and at least three degrees warmer by the end of the century. So 2020 really does look set to be an historically important year in the fortunes of our civilization, not to mention countless other species that are unwittingly relying on us humans not screwing up. Can our nations finally come together to reach consensus on rapid implementation of climate mitigation strategies? Will developed and developing nations cooperate and make sacrifices for the greater good of humanity? Or will we continue along the road of political polarization and inward looking tribal nationalism? I'll let you have a think about that as you munch through your Christmas dinner leftovers. As always, thanks for watching. Have a fantastic New Year's and here's to a hopefully peaceful and prosperous 2020. See you next year.